27. 727 is faith is the victory. We're going to stand and do the first, the second, and then the last verse, please. Encamped along the hills of life, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the
children will come. Miss Nancy has our children's sermon today. we've got this morning. We've got a lot of boys and girls coming. Who would like to be a superhero today? Caleb would like to be a superhero. I know Sawyer wants to be a superhero. Yes, look at those hands coming up. Did you know there's a lot of superheroes in the Bible? I'm you okay? Did you know that Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 12, verses 42 and uh, 43, that there was a poor widow. And, you know, she came to Jesus and all the other people were putting all kinds of money in the offering plate. But she only had two small copper coins. But that was all she had. But you know what Jesus said? He said, truly I tell you, the poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. Boys and girls, do you see this jug right here? Yeah. Okay. There's this little girl. And her name is Penny Miles. Do you know how many pennies it takes to make a mile? Guess. A lot of them. How about 84,480 pennies to make a mile? You do. Well, did you know what? That many pennies can make a big mile. But I'll tell you a little bit about the mascot. Her name is Penny Miles. Penny Miles, she did not, you know, like you boys and girls sometimes have a place to sleep. She didn't have one. She didn't get to stay in her home. So the chip, so the people at Sunrise took her in. And you know what? They got her into a beautiful foster home that had clean sheets on a bed, had nice food to eat. But you know what the most important thing that Sunrise did for her? They could tell her about Jesus and how he died on the cross to save us from our sins. Now then, this gives us the opportunity here to be a hero. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tony told us this morning in Sunday school about the opportunity and th that we have to make a difference in others and how we should seize that moment? What do you all think about seizing that moment and being a, a hero for Jesus and help these boys and girls at sunrise? Did you know what? I looked on my, over there on the nightstand and the love of my life, Mr. Kenny, he went to be with Jesus five years ago last Saturday. This, he used to come in every morning from work, and you know what he would do? He would empty out his pockets. And these had some pennies in them, and I think I took it out of there, but these are quarters and nickels and dimes, and I believe that this is what he, he loved Jesus, and he loved sunrise. Amen. I think he would want to put those in there. They've been sitting there now for five years, so I need somebody to help me put this money in the jug. Okay, Daisy, do you think you can take that top off of there for me? Okay. Look here, let's put this money in here. And see how that will go for a while. That's going to fill up the bottom. And you know what? This morning, Miss Sharon, you know, when she does her laundry, especially her daughter's laundry, <laughs> she don't take her pennies out of the pocket. She don't take money out of the pocket. You know what Miss Sharon says? What's in my house is mine. <laughs> See this sack? She brought in money this morning. Look, 
Lost pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. And you know what? Look what Miss Cindy brought in this morning. Oh, okay. She brought in a glass jug. They got all kinds of money in here. Boys and girls, when you all find a penny on the street or whatever, okay. Oh, I have. Uh, well, now you find my bad boy's truck. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think you better ask that. Okay, boys and girls, this this <laughs> Let's, and you have some pennies, bring them to Jesus to help the boys and girls at sunrise. Okay, does anybody want to pray? Caleb, you want to pray? Come on, I'll help you. Come here, honey. He's going to, he's going to, Caleb knows how to pray. Okay, boys and girls, let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Be real still. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our family and our friends. Thank you for our food. Thank you for our home. And thank you for everything. And anybody that could help them to feel better. And anybody that. So I'm thankful for everything. Amen. Now, the boys and girls, I'm going to get. Mr. Kenny brought me in some things this morning to give you. Here's a, here's a bracelet. And you can wear these. Remember, when you do, you remember the children of sunrise and how you're going to save your pennies and bring them in. Let's see who can. That's all right. Pass this down. Okay? Sawyer wants one. That's it. Okay. Here's one. Here, Hudson. We have plenty. We've got one for everyone. Who needs one? Me. Okay. I need one. Yes. Dawson, there's one for you. And Caleb needs one. Tony, you need one. You got one? Okay. You got one for yourself? Okay. But he might want to hit one too. Yeah. Okay, does everyone have one? Okay. Let's challenge the big people in the auditorium, okay? And see who can bring in the most pennies. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Let's go back to your, to your oasis. We'll keep these pennies in. Wait, but I don't repair it. She really does that. And that's okay. So, a pull it like this. <laughs> Miss Nancy, I'm not sure what you meant by big people. She meant everyone. It'll be all right. Yes, always. always. Yeah, you know, this morning, I don't know if you all have days like this, but when I woke up this morning, you know what my first w thought was? I can't wait to get home this afternoon and take a nap. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> when you wake up and you're looking forward to taking a nap, that's bad. Uh, but, but then that led to a discussion with Patty and I about, about we ought to have, you know, the kids at school have pajama day at school. Maybe we ought to have a pajama day at church. You know? <laughs> 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 you know, come in your pajamas. And, uh, you know, for those of you who sleep during church, that'd be even more better. You, know? <laughs> you got this. Actually, what we want to do, Rob and I were talking, we want to have an old-fashioned day where we can wear our bib overalls, you know. Oh, Except right. Rob said he wouldn't go to wear a shirt if he did. But... <laughs> yeah, that may stop the whole thing right there. All right, well, before I get to the things, let's go on. We're looking today again in Luke chapter 4, and we're talking about the temptation of Jesus. So I'd ask if you're able to stand, to stand with us, please, in honor of God's Word, as we look at verse 1 and 2 of that chapter. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. 
Let's pray. Father God, we all have those temptations in our lives. Those things, Lord, that seem to pull us away from you and toward the flesh, toward the world, toward our own desires. And so, Father, we pray that as we examine today what our Lord Jesus went through and how he was victorious, that we too can find that same peace, that same power in our lives to just say no when temptation comes knocking at our door. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question, and, 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 and I want you to answer simply, if it's true for you, by saying amen. Are you ever tempted? Amen. 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 Yeah. Does anybody want to tell us what your temptation is? No. We'd be glad to know. Yeah. All right. I don't really expect you to. I don't want you to, really. We don't want to have no squirrel thing going on here. Sorry. But we all have temptation in our lives. I was hungry. In one way or another. And temptations come to us from many different angles, just like they did for Jesus. And we know he was tempted because... Luke tells us, Matthew tells us that, this, this same story. And then later on in Hebrews 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. In Luke's gospel, there are three examples of temptations that Jesus faced. And I think when you look at them, you can realize that these are the three main ways that all of us are tempted. Uh, they are sensual temptations, spiritual temptations, and scriptural temptations. And everything that we face, just about every temptation you and I have brought before us, can probably fall in one of these three categories. And so we're going to examine how Jesus dealt with them, and perhaps we can learn better how we can deal with them. Now... Some people will say, well, Brother Scott, Jesus was God, and I'm not, so I can't resist like he did. Okay, I, I, I can understand that. But let's also understand how Jesus was able to resist. Let's understand what it was that caused him to be able to say no to Satan when he tempted him. And, and, and as we look at that, we will see that he really didn't have an advantage over us that was not available to us today in our life that we can access also. But the first thing we read, and the reason that he was able to resist and that we can resist is because Jesus was spirit-filled. Verse 1 and 2, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had complete control in the life of Jesus. Whatever the Spirit said for him to do, he willingly obeyed the Spirit. Uh, notice it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We just saw last week how Jesus got baptized and God spoke and the Spirit came and, and all those things took place and had a wonderful experience it was. But then we also find that immediately from this very high exciting time in his life when people all around are saying, wow, he's the Messiah. The Spirit says it's time to leave the crowds and go into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness area is outside uh, in, in the desert areas, uh, very barren, uh, not much uh, there in way of water or food or, or of comfort. And, and the Spirit led him. Dr. John Phillips writes, the time and the place and the circumstances of the Lord's temptation were all chosen by the Holy Spirit. You see, just like with you and I, God allows only what He knows we can resist, we can overcome, or we can endure, and He did the same with Jesus. God never puts something on us that He has not prepared us 
to be able to deal with. Now, we may think, well, God, maybe you're not really, I don't really understand my situation, but he doesn't. He does understand. He, he does know what we can handle because he has created us, and he knows every intricate detail about our life. And so he never allows a temptation to come to us that he has not given us the power to overcome. You see, this was not the devil's power working against Jesus. This was God's plan. This was God's purpose for him to endure this temptation, to record it in his word so that you and I would know that Jesus understood what it was to be tempted. You remember what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. For God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but will with the temptation also provide, provide a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. God promises that he will give us that power so that when temptation comes and it knocks on our door, he says, listen, I, I've got just the answer for you. I have the Holy Spirit and he'll answer the door for you and we'll see what temptation does then. If we will rely upon the Holy Spirit's work and his power in us, then we too can have victory like Jesus did. But before we can have that victory, we have to be filled with His Spirit. Now, is that possible? Absolutely. Jesus Himself promised that we would be and we would see it happen in the church. Look at John 14, verse 15 through 18. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because he doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him. Why? Because he remains in you, with you, and will be in you. God's Spirit lives in us. He doesn't live around the corner at somebody else's house. If we're a child of God, he lives in us. And he says, I will not leave you as orphans. Then he goes on in verse 23. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father, God, will love me and we will love him and we will come to him, that is the believer who, allows, who accepts Jesus, and we will make our home with him. Now, isn't that a great thought? God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit come to us in the form of the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And, and, and on the day of Pentecost, we read about this happening, Acts 2, verse 4. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Acts 4, 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak God's message with boldness. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Then Ephesians 5, 18, Paul says, Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit. Now, how do we do that? How are we filled with the Spirit of God? Well, as I have taught you over these years, and you have heard it from others, the very millisecond, before he can even blink an eye, the very millisecond when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you pray that prayer or you say to him, Lord, I, I believe in you and I ask you to be Lord of my life, that very millisecond, the Holy Spirit enters us and he never leaves. Never. He comes into us immediately. He fills us from top to bottom. Listen to what Peter told the people in Acts 2. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The moment you pray and receive Christ, you receive that gift. Later, John, and right in 1 John, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes when we are saved. At 1 Corinthians 3.15, excuse me, I didn't finish 27, did I? And you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. 
just as he has taught you, remain in him. So the Holy Spirit is there to teach us. Jesus told us that. He is there to empower us and strengthen us in every way. 1 Corinthians 3.15, don't you yourselves know that you are God's sanctuary and the Spirit of God lives in you? So understand what, what we're, we're saying here. is the same Holy Spirit, the same power that was in Jesus is in us. It's not like he got more than we did. The very same Holy Spirit was given to us. Now, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Jesus totally submitted to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because he said yes to everything the Holy Spirit asked of him, because he said no when the Holy Spirit said no, he was able to resist the temptation. Now, here's where we kind of differ. We control how much of the Holy Spirit we surrender to. He doesn't force himself. He is there inside of us. You know, it's like having, having uh, this jug full up here, these jugs full of coins. And one day we decide, you know, I need some of those coins. So we open it up and we pour out how much we want. That's sort of what happens with us in the Holy Spirit. He is there. Everything we could ever want is there from him. But we decide how much control he has in our life. And so when he says to us, you need to resist this thing and I will give you strength. And we say, no, no, thanks. I think I'll handle this on my own. That's when we get in trouble. And that's when a temptation overcomes us. So let's look at these three areas of temptation and see how as we submit to the Holy Spirit, we let him have control, how we can gain victory also. The first thing we see is that Jesus was tempted sensually. Excuse me. Verse 3 and 4. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of those days, he was hungry. <laughs> he was there 40 days without food. I can't go four hours without being hungry. <laughs> but Jesus was there 40 days, and he was hungry. You can imagine. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. <laughs> Satan says, Jesus, you're hungry. I know you've got to be hungry. I know you've got to be hungry, so you have the power to meet that need right this moment. Look around you, Jesus. All these little rocks are flat and they're smooth. They look like little loaves of bread. Jesus, just go ahead and, and turn one of those stones into bread. I know you can do it. Go ahead. <laughs> Satisfy that sensual need of hunger in your life. Now, what do we mean by sensual? Well, the dictionary defines sensual as appealing to are derived from the senses. What are the senses that we have? There are five basic senses. There is sight and sound and smell and, and taste and touch. Jesus in this moment experiences them all, really. He hears the, sees the sight, there's the stones, the sound, the devil is speaking to him, how you can do this. Then there's the smell, the touch, and the taste. You know, whenever you, 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 somebody mentions some kind of food to you and you're really hungry, can't you taste it? And you can smell it, you know, and, and, and you can feel the, you can think about the texture of it in your mouth, and you can, oh, that's so good. But don't, don't be thrown that very long. But, but Jesus is tempted in all those ways. I mean, he's hungry. And, and, and he looks at that stone, and it looks just like the flat loaf of bread like Mama Mary used to make. And, and it would have been easy for him to have done what Satan said. Now, most of the time we think of sensual sin, uh, most people, the first thing that comes to mind is sexual sin. And, and there are many the types of sin like that. We're going to talk about several sensual sins, but there are many types of sexual sin. To be involved sexually with someone you're not married to is sin. If you're single, it's called fornication in Scripture. If you're married, it's called adultery. You remember in the, in the Old Testament, Genesis, Joseph, a young single man, was, was being seduced by Potiphar's wife. And what did Joseph do? He fled. He ran away from her. And he said, how can I sin against my God and do this terrible thing? I can't do that. He, he made up his mind. He was going to resist. Now, then we have another case in the Old Testament of David and Bathsheba. David, and David saw Bathsheba. They're taking a bath on a roof, and he, he became overwhelmed with lust, sensual desire. He had her brought to him. He was sexually active with her. She became pregnant. 
And then later on, David in Psalm 51, when he is confronted with his sin, says, God, I acknowledge my sin before you. He knew that what he had done was sin. Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Flee from sexual immorality and all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Whether it's, it's in being in a relationship with someone that you're not married to, or whether it's homosexuality, or, or all the other kinds of sexual sin that are out there, these things are called sin. And that's not my word, that's God's word that says that. That's not me telling you that, it's God telling you that. For a sec, sec, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people or idolaters or adulterers or anyone practicing homosexuality, and he goes on to say, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, but we also need to understand this, that sensual sin is not limited to sexual sin. And sexual sin is not the worst sin in the world. It's not the one that, that God hates the most. There's all kinds of sensual sin out there that God hates. Let me give you some examples. Uh, what about taste? Are there things we like that we like to taste that are not good for us? Yes. Man, I confess, one of the temptations I have is to eat way more than I should and eat stuff I shouldn't eat. And, and we have to learn how to control that. There may be other things we like to eat or drink or put into our bodies that cause us not to quite be ourselves. And we have to avoid those things. Or maybe it's the taste of revenge that we get. Or the taste of getting back at someone. And we kind of like how that tastes, you know, get it to get our revenge. But that's also sin in God's eyes. What about touch? Well, have you ever been tempted to do a five-finger discount? How many of you know what a five-finger discount is? Yeah. yeah, it's when you go somewhere and you pick up something that's not, not yours and you don't pay for it and you take it with you. Did that some when I was younger. <laughs> Sharon, had, Sharon can tell you. <laughs> she had to go back to the store with me to pay for it. But anyway. <laughs> Sometimes we, we take things that aren't really ours, and it doesn't always come in the form of snatching a candy bar off the rack. Sometimes, sometimes it comes in the form of envy and jealousy. Somebody has something we think we ought to have and we become angry because they have it and we don't. Or maybe it takes the form of cheating. We, we, we take someone's knowledge. You know, we, we copy their answers and we, we cheat or, or we do things with our money to our advantage that causes someone else pain. Maybe it's sound, the temptation of sound. We listen to gossip. Oh, 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 yeah, I met with her. Or, or we listen to some music that we shouldn't listen to, or we listen to some joke or some story that really is not pleasing to God. You say, well, brush God, those things aren't as bad as, as this or that. Yes, they are. They're sin before God. What about sight? What, do we watch things and look at things that maybe make us think about things we shouldn't? Is pornography a problem for some? Yes. You see, those are just a few examples of sensual sins that go beyond sexual sin. And, and, and none of them are pleasing to God. None of them should be practiced by we who claim to serve and follow Christ. 1 John 2, 6, if we say we abide in him, we should walk just as Jesus did. But look how Jesus responded to this temptation. Verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Matthew, when he writes about this, adds this to the statement Jesus made, but he should live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Real satisfaction comes whenever we take God's word and we read it and we believe it and we apply it to our life. That's where real satisfaction can come. Uh, not from satisfying the, the physical desires of our life, but being satisfied spiritually. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But then that leads us to the second temptation we see Jesus had. He was tempted spiritually. Verse 5. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Can you imagine? I mean, Satan has this power to take Jesus to a very, very high mountain. And, and you know, if you've ever been to some place like if you've ever been to the, uh, what's it called in Gatlinburg up there? The, the ch no, no, the oh, big thing. Uh, Clingman's Dome. Dome. Yeah, you go up there and you can see like three or four states from that, that spot. Or there are places like other places in the country you can go and you can see several states at one time. 
But Satan takes him up to a high mountain, and, and probably it's not a visual thing as much as it is a vision kind of thing. And, and he shows him all these kingdoms. He says, look at her, Jesus. Look at all these kingdoms out here. Some scholars say he even showed him the kingdoms of the future. I don't know if he did or not. But, 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 but he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, look, Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Now, how did Satan get that kind of authority? How did Satan get that kind of power that he could say to Jesus, here, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. You, you, you want to die and bring in the kingdom of God? I'll just give you all the kingdoms now. How could he do that? Well, in Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8, we get an understanding. But one has, but one has somewhere testified, this is out of the book of Psalms, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him more than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. Now, remember the Garden of Eden? When God established Adam and Eve there, he said, Adam, I'm giving you authority over everything. You're going to have authority over the animals. And over everything, Adam, I'm giving that to you. But then look at the last verse here in Hebrews, verse 8. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. Man hasn't got that authority that God gave him in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because Adam and Eve sinned. And they lost the right to that authority. And guess who claimed it? Satan, the devil. He claimed that authority because Adam and Eve had rejected God. He had led them to reject God, and now he had sort of earned this authority. And so until it, and so we want one day Jesus is going to take it back. Amen. But until then, Satan has been given the ability to influence things in this world. Now we know it's limited. His power to, to, to do things in this world is limited. Remember the story of Job? Job said, and God said, Job, uh, Satan, you can do whatever you want to Job except take his life. And so Satan can only do what God allows. And so even though he has authority, he doesn't do anything outside of what God allows him to do and what God prepares us to be able to resist. Listen to what Jesus said, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world and the ruler of this world Jesus acknowledged Satan at this time is the ruler of this world. He will be cast out. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Again, Satan has this great influence in the world. Revelation 13, 2, talks about talking about the rising of the Antichrist. <clears throat> the beast I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like a bear's and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. This is the Antichrist. The dragon, Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So Satan had this power just as he offered it to Jesus. So he offers it and gives it to this Antichrist who, rise, who will arise one day and gives him this authority. Now, what was the price that Satan asked of Jesus to, get, to have this easy way to gain authority over the world? Verse 7, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Well, that sounds simple enough, doesn't it? If you will just worship me, it will all be yours. And this is a one-time deal. Just once. Jesus, just bow down to me one time. Worship me one time. That's all I ask. And I'll give you the control of everything. Some people say, and sadly, and sometimes even Christians say, well, does it really matter who we worship? Does it really matter? As long as you believe in something, isn't that good enough? And, I mean, isn't God going to let everybody come into heaven? No. No. Society says we should accept all religions and, and understand that, that, that God wants everybody there. No. He does. Yes, He wants everybody there. But it doesn't mean that we... Get there by believing anything. Jesus said, John 14, 6, 
I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Now, I've had folks, I've even had Christian folks tell me, we're just narrow-minded. <laughs> you need to read what other religions say. I have. <laughs> I have read. I've studied other religions. <laughs> and I still choose Jesus. Amen. Amen. I still choose Jesus. There are two choices we have in life. Jesus said there's a narrow gate that leads to heaven, that leads to God. And there's a wide gate that leads to the world and destruction in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. There are many who will say, worship anyway, worship whoever, whatever. Don't, don't be so picky. No, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Look how Jesus responded. <laughs> Jesus answered, it is written, <laughs> refers back to Scripture, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Even one time, Satan, would be one time too many to worship you. And then thirdly, we see Jesus was tempted scripturally. Verse 9. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Once more, we see Satan, as he did in the Garden of Eden, as he did has done throughout history, twisting God's words. That, that's Satan's favorite tool, to take the word of God and twist it around so we, we kind of can justify our sins. I can think of when I was a teenager and I used to try to figure out ways that I could get by with some stuff. And I would say, well, you know, God, the Bible doesn't really say I can't do this, <laughs> You know, and I, I would always frame it in a way that I could find where the Bible didn't speak about this particular sin or that particular sin, and I could get by with it. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't twist God's word. Satan is telling Jesus, Jesus, nobody knows you, really. Nobody cares about you, and you're never going to make an impact on this world unless you do something spectacular. Here you are, Jesus. We're up on top of the temple. Big, high place, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 foot drop. But if you were to jump off here, the Bible says that God will send his angels and they, they will keep you from stumbling and they'll flap their big wings and they'll, they'll lower you down right into the middle of the temple courtyard and everybody will see it and they'll go, wow. He must really be somebody if the angels will carry him down from the top of the temple. Well, Jesus knew this was a distortion of the word. Here's what the word said, Psalm 91. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all ways. That part was true. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will even tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. But here's why God is going to do that in the next verse. Verse 14. Because he is lovingly devoted to me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. The reason that God would do those things for Jesus that Satan left out was because his heart was given totally to God. His desire was to be submissive to the will of God. He's lovingly devoted to me. He knows my name. He knows me intimately. If Jesus had done what Satan asked, if he jumped off and the angels that came and carried him down, it would have meant that he left his devotion to God and had given it to Satan. Look how Jesus responded, verse 12. Jesus answered, it is written again. He always responded with Scripture. So should we. When that temptation comes, 
And it, it's just a little thing that, that I try to do in my life. I know what my temptations are. I know what my soft spots are. I know where Satan attacks me the most. And, and so I need to read Scripture, memorize Scripture that, that applies to those temptations. And whenever it comes, I need to begin to quote those verses to Satan and say, nope, Jesus said, the Word of God says that I should do this and not that. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's not what Satan said, but Jesus said, this is what God says. And so he resisted him. And then look what happens. Satan leaves for a while, but he will return. So we must be prepared. Verse 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, probably much more than we have recorded, he left him until an opportune time. I want you to know that you and I, you know, there are those days whenever, you know, we grab the devil by his horns and we say, no, nope, you're not going to win today. I'm going to resist you. And eventually he backs off and he goes to buy, get somebody else that's easier to pray. But he doesn't stay gone, does he? He comes back. And over and over again he comes back. And we have to offer that same fight again. Because we are engaged, the Bible says, in a battle between two great powers. The all-powerful God and the little sniveling Satan who, who has great authority in this world. Jesus stands opposed to everything the devil stands for. And he brings freedom from Satan's control, Satan's influence to those who will follow him. Satan seeks to mislead us by lying and testing and tempting us. But Jesus came to destroy the devil's wicked works. That was his purpose in coming. And he defeated Satan and sin on the cross. And he paid for our sin by his own body and blood on the cross. He then defeated Satan and death and the grave through the power of his resurrection. So that, because of what he did, we now have the power available to us and within us to be victorious over sin and temptation also. How? The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The same tools that Jesus had are the same tools that we have. So, you know, we're not God in the flesh, but we have the same tools, the same power to do what Jesus did. Do we have it in our life today? Have we accepted God's gift of salvation that He offered to us through what Jesus did and does? Have we made a decision to admit that we are sinners? Believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came and died on the cross and paid for our sin and that God raised him from the dead then to commit our life to him and declare it to the world. If you haven't done that, then today, if you want to have victory over temptation, if you want to have victory over sin, that's where you must begin. And then God will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And, and if you've done that today... If you've already made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, we need to ask the question, are we having victory over temptation that God provided for us through the example of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and through His written Word? Do we have that victory today? Or maybe there are some things that we have not yet gained control of. There are still some things that we are battling every single day. And it may just be there are some things we don't want to really give up. I mean, but I like it, Jesus. I like it, God. If we're going to receive everything that God has for us, if we're going to be faithful and obedient servants to Him, we have to be willing to give it up. Be willing to just say no. With His power, on the authority of His Word, to say no. The question really is for us today, will we? Jesus overcame temptation. He gives us the power to overcome temptation. Do we have it today? Father, I pray that, Lord, all of us struggle. All of us. Lord, none of us are worse sinners than others. N none of us, Father God, are, are, are lower in your eyes than anybody else. But Father God, we all have sin. We all have temptation. 
And Father, we need victory over it. And, and so, Father, we pray first of all, if there's anyone here who has not made Jesus Christ Lord of their life, that today, this moment, they will invite Him in. And that You will fill them with Your Spirit. And that, Father God, they will begin to find the strength to say no. And Father, we pray for we who are believers that, that whatever it is that we are struggling with today, whatever it is that is hindering us, whatever it is that Lord has a hold on us that we don't want to let go of, help us to say, Lord, I, I want it out of my life. I don't want it in my life anymore. I don't want this thing to be, be hindering me from what you would do with me and through me and in me. Help me to have victory over it. Lord, we just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invitation to him is 638. I need thee every hour. If we're going to have victory in Jesus over temptation, we need him every hour, every minute, every second. Have we given him that authority in our life? Do we release that power to him? If not, today, let's do that as we stand and sing.